Well, Merry Christmas. Hey, I'm sure most of us know that the Bible is divided into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Which is ironic because all of it is old, right? It's all old. The Bible was written roughly 2,700 years ago. But even as a bound printed book, the Bible is still old. The King James Version was written over 400 years ago. 400 years is a long time. It's even longer time for God to say nothing. 400 years would be a long time for God to be silent. And that is the same distance between the King James Version being printed and today as when the Old Testament was written and Jesus was born. There's roughly 14 more days <laughs> till Christmas, and we're going to have to wait another 365 days until the next Christmas. But that first Christmas came hundreds of years after it was first announced. And so the very first book of the New Testament is Matthew, and this is how Matthew begins his Christmas story. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jehoiakim, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jehoiakim was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abud, and Abud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Elihud, and Elihud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Wow! Right? Can you just feel the Christmas spirit? It is a magical time. What? I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking... Pastor David, you're not supposed to read those verses. You're supposed to skip to verse 18. <laughs> What's the matter? Your, your hearts weren't stirred with passion with the reading of this genealogy? Why not? It's all God's word. Yes, but Matthew chapter 1 is about as boring as reading a phone book. Yeah, but Matthew thought it was exciting, and he thought it was important to the Christmas story. So we should talk about why. Matthew wants us to know a few things. First, Christmas is about the birth of a man. Matthew wants you to know that Jesus' birth fits into history. Jesus' story is not fluid, it's not ethereal, it's grounded in years and dates and generations. It's just like your birthday. Jesus was born in a time in human history, and his ancestors are known, and we know their stories. Jesus is also Jewish. He's one of the, child, uh, the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, so he has community. He has, uh, he has a people. His father's name is Joseph, and Joseph can trace his lineage all the way back to David, who was Israel's greatest king. 
Matthew wants you to know, first and foremost, Jesus was a person. He was a human. And genealogies like this were common. But there is something interesting here. This genealogy is what is known as a patrilineal descent, meaning you trace the lineage back through men. And you might think, well, of course, because back then everything was about men. Perhaps, but not with Jewish people. Jewish descent is matrilineal. That is to say, the child of a Jewish mother is automatically Jewish. So if Matthew were trying to prove that he was Jewish, he would have traced Mary's lineage. And if you read the, the list in Luke, that is what Luke does. So why does Matthew trace the lineage through men? Well, that's because tribal affiliation is traced through the, through the father. And so Luke wants you to know that Jesus is from the tribe of kings. Matthew says his name is Jesus, he was born a man, he was born at a time and a place, and he was born a king. But did you notice something else? There's actually four women named in this genealogy. You saw that, right? He says, here's Tamar, here's Rahab, here's Ruth, here's Bathsheba. That is very interesting. Because, you know, if you were only trying to showcase royal lineage, any self-respecting Jew would leave these women's names out. Why? Well, because they're not women of good reputation. Tamar was guilty of incest. She had relations with her father-in-law. Rahab was a prostitute. Bathsheba was adulteress. And none of them were Jewish. One was a Hittite, one was a Moabite, the other two are Gentiles. What are Gentiles doing in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? This is the Son of God. So why would you include these names? It's, it's like listing a bad job on your resume. You would leave it off, I suppose. I suppose you'd leave those names off if you were trying to impress Jews. Or if you were trying to say that Jesus came to only be the king of the Jews. But Jesus came to be the king of all. Is there any comfort, including those names? If you were a foreigner and you read that list, is there comfort for you? Matthew's a tax collector. So even though he is Jewish, he still lives as a person on the outside. He lives in the fringe. His own people would have treated him as a foreigner. So Matthew does everything he can in this list to elevate Jesus and humanize Jesus at the same time. Yes, he is a king, but he's not a king that cannot be approached. He is tangible. He's relatable. He's the king of the universe, and he was born like us. And just like one of us, he is a man with a past. He has a few nuts in his family tree. Philippians 2 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. The Bible says Jesus came in humility. Christmas is about the birth of a man and it is about the birth of a God. Matthew 1 verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. After Matthew records his long list of human parents, he highlights one fact. He says, found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And just in case there was ever any doubt, an angel stops by and confirms it. And Matthew supports that claim with Bible prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Kind of makes you wonder what Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7 is about. In Isaiah 7, Ahaz is the king of Judah. And this is during a time where they were under threat from both Syria and Israel because they had made an alliance together. The Jewish people were split at this time. God sent the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz to give him a message saying, don't lose heart. Be calm, be quiet, don't be afraid. The Lord was telling him, you don't need to go to your allies in Egypt or any other earthly, earthly nation. God is gonna provide the win. He even tells Ahaz, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Ahaz ignores this message from God, and the Bible says, God again spoke to Ahaz. This time, God tells Ahaz, look, if you don't believe me, ask for a sign, right? Just do it. If, if you don't believe me, if you don't trust me, go ahead, ask for a sign. You know, there's another man in the Bible named Gideon who asked for a sign from God. He wanted to know if he was going to do God's will. And when he received the sign, he knew that he was in God's will and he obeyed God. He had direction, he had faith. And that sign from God gave him courage to act. And this is the same thing that God is offering Ahaz. But Ahaz has pride, he's arrogant, and he, he responds back with this cliche. He says, I will not ask because I will not put the Lord to the test. But the reality is Ahaz didn't believe. He didn't have faith and he really didn't want to hear anything that was contrary to what he wanted to do. You know, he had his own plan. He wanted an army. Ahaz wanted to team up with Egypt and he wanted to crush his enemies. But God had a better plan and he wanted Ahaz to trust him. Has this ever happened to you? You know, you have your own plans, you have your own path, you have your own life, and then you feel that little nudge. You get that feeling that God wants you to take a different path, but you don't want to hear it. And instead of harboring hate or taking revenge, or instead of making the distance between ourselves and our enemies even wider, it's becoming more and more apparent that God wants you to do something different. And we know we should just hand our burden over to God. We should pray. We should seek his will. But sometimes it's just more fun being mad. We'd rather be indignant or offended or play the victim than to simply just look for a sign because we like our plan. But the sign that God gives to Ahaz is the same sign that he gives the entire world. Isaiah told Ahaz, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God didn't want to give Ahaz an army to crush his enemies with. Instead, God wanted to give Ahaz a baby. And Isaiah says, they shall call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. Emmanuel is a miracle. The name of Jesus is incarnation. It is divine empathy. It is God coming down and pitching his tent with me by my side so I can feel him and know his presence. In the darkest hours of my life, the name Emmanuel gives me hope. 
It means when you ask for a human army of flesh and bone to help fight your battles, God says, I have a better idea. I'm going to send myself. Emmanuel means you don't fight your battle alone. Now, I'm sure you don't want an army this Christmas, <laughs> right? That's not on your Christmas list. So what does this mean for you and me? What is this name of Jesus? First, the name of Jesus means salvation. You know, Ahaz and Judah were full of fear and trembling because of their fear of being attacked by their enemy. But Emmanuel is a sign of God's saving presence. Emmanuel is a sign that God will deliver his people. Remember what the angel tells Joseph. The angel says, give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. So the name of Jesus means Savior, but it also means promise. The name of Jesus means that God will not leave or forsake his people. The name Emmanuel is a promise. It is a word of hope that no matter how desperate conditions become or no matter how dark the road seems ahead, we know that God is with us. Emmanuel means that even in the situation where we feel like we are left alone to brood or to feel pain or hate or anger or hurt or fear, take any situation that someone might be going through right now, even at Christmas, unemployment, death, divorce, bankruptcy, poverty, illness, surgery, pain, cancer. Emmanuel means that God is with us even then. It's his promise. Emmanuel means that even in a tough situation, God surrounds us with his love, his presence, his spirit. And third, Jesus means forever. You know, it's not part of the Christmas story. In fact, it's at the end of Jesus' story where we hear the name Emmanuel one last time. In Matthew 28, it says the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus leaves his disciples, but not in despair. He leaves them with his name. He says, behold, Emmanuel forever. Behold means, don't miss this. Be sure to notice this. Isaiah tells the king, God is giving you a sign anyway. Don't miss it. Behold, his name is Jesus. And he will be with you, the Bible says, always. Always at your side. At the beginning, in the morning, when you rise up, at the end of your day, when you go to bed, in your triumphs, in your successes, and even when you bow in quiet loneliness. Whether you are surrounded by friends or family, or when you feel forgotten or forsaken, behold, Emmanuel forever. This Christmas, don't miss the sign. Don't miss the sign of hope and peace and love, the sign of promise, the song heard at the manger, the angel anthem raised still echoes through the ages today. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, and his name is Jesus. Have a blessed and wonderful Christmas season. I hope for you, it's the best Christmas ever. Merry Christmas.